Here is a United Nations mission that is 100% European. 3,700 soldiers under a UN mandate are charged with securing a vast, volatile portion of Chad and the Central African Republic, or CAR, refugee zones. The head of operations is Irish, and 14 countries are contributing troops to U4 here. The EU High Representative for Common Foreign and Security Policy is proud of their performance. I would like to say that if the more people who have come here to see what is being done here, I think the support in the member state will be, will be growing. The U4 Chad CAR operation is the biggest the EU has ever organized. Yet the bloc has already placed forces in 17 theaters of tension on four continents in the past five years. That means 10,000 men and women in military uniform and 3,000 police and paramilitaries. Europe's top diplomat considers that a respectable accomplishment. We have already deployed 18 missions, which is extraordinary if you think of where we started. I believe we have to continue in this direction and that all the countries of the EU are ready for it. With U4, even neutral states, non-NATO members who would otherwise never have set foot in Afghanistan or Iraq have a role, such as Austria and Ireland. This shows a budding European defense identity at some levels. But public opinion does not seem to have latched onto this. We hear from the head of the European Parliament's subcommittee on defense. When I explain to my fellow citizens why it was so important to do something in the Balkans, it's obvious. We also have refugees that came from the Balkans. We've lived that in Germany. It's not the same thing where Africa is concerned. It's a problem that concerns the Mediterranean countries, whose voters are not well aware of this problem. The bulk of the EU force in Chad is French. Germany is absent. That's not to contest Europe's defense identity, it's because of German domestic politics. Britain's position is more ambiguous. It hasn't been in on the EU's bigger missions. The Franco-British Saint-Malo agreement on European defense in 1998 raised hopes. Key elements from this are now in the EU's Lisbon reform treaty, but war in Iraq chafed relations between Paris and London. Ten years after Saint-Malo, President Sarkozy wants to show the EU partners his faith in the transatlantic relationship. He's been sending signals to Washington. He's even lofted the possibility of reintegrating France into NATO's military command structure. That pullout goes all the way back to General de Gaulle. Today's French Minister of Defense says a page has turned. I believe that everyone thinks there's at least one thing that is evolving a lot. France has often been suspected of proposing a European security and defence policy versus the Atlantic Alliance. I believe that now everybody has understood that the one is not incompatible with the other. On the contrary, if we wanted a more European Atlantic Alliance, European defence would have to have more structures and more forces. This line of talk caught the Americans' attention. The U.S. ambassador to NATO confirms that President Bush made that known at the recent alliance summit in Romania. Well, it, it certainly makes everybody more comfortable when instead of saying you need a stronger EU instead of a stronger NATO, we are all saying you need a stronger EU and a stronger NATO and a stronger relationship between them. So instead of pulling in opposite directions, we're now, we're now pulling together. In spite of such encouragement from the U.S., London is still frowning. But others faithful to the U.S., such as Poland, have already made clear they intend to participate fully in a European defense. We think a second European pillar should be added, other than NATO, which has been our mainstay for 18 years. We think that being in an exclusive club like the EU, we should contribute to make the club strong and efficient and guarantee member security. France takes up the EU presidency for six months starting on July the 1st. The ground seems to have been well prepared for it to pursue its defense ambitions. 
France wants to improve common European military capacity. It wants to press ahead with the EU's own rapid reaction force, which the leaders made a headline goal in 1999, to be equipped with autonomous headquarters, pooled material and satellite intelligence. Paris is also keen on an officer exchange program. This is both to develop the European consciousness and a common military culture. That's where the idea of a military Erasmus comes from, as it exists for students. It could for common military training. The Lisbon Treaty promises the EU more credibility by endowing the bloc with a streamlined institutional decision mechanism in that the security policy high representative becomes more of a real minister for foreign affairs. Defense expert Nicole Niasotto considers this. The treaty's most important provision, as I see it, isn't strictly about the security and defense policy, but about foreign policy. It's really the revolution in coherence, this giving the future high representative not only a full role in foreign policy, security and defense, but part of the European Commission's financial resources. This means that when the European Council Council now decides to embark on a crisis management operation, the High Representative will not only have at his disposal the military and police offered by the Member States, but above all the funds that the former External Relations Commissioner had. This can now be totally synergized. An army marches on its wallet. Today, few countries in the EU dedicate more than 2% of their GDP to military spending. Having worked in a future defense policy brainstorming group for President Sarkozy, Nyasoto has studied the possibility of a communal defense budget. Defence policy operations today have a total aberration to deal with in the financing system. We have a system where the more troops you put on the ground, the more you pay. Obviously, when you're a big country like Germany, you have two difficulties in the Bundestag, the political aspect of sending out the troops, plus the spending aspect. And when you don't put any troops in, like the British for several years, where you don't pay anything. When the next negotiations on the multi-annual EU budget are launched, the bloc's members will have to decide how much money they want to put towards soft power abroad, such as trade and humanitarian aid, and how effectively they can develop hard power, armed men.